let's uh, jump into it. I will uh, happy to be here for, uh, I, I guess this is my third nice talk now, uh, since we've uh, published Loihi. Of course, we skipped last year. So um, this has been three years now of, uh, of, of Loihi on, uh, you know, in, in the community uh, in use and uh, happy to give an update on where we're at and starting to reflect a little bit on, on some of the lessons that we can draw from uh, what we've learned. So, uh, and I'll uh, hopefully won't spend too much time on, on just the basic motivation, but I think, you know, there's always new members to the community hasn't heard of, uh, you know, the background and, and some of the guiding motivation here. So, and it's always interesting to think about from different perspectives. So uh, I'll begin with some general uh, setting for, for what we're doing uh, at Intel and what our uh, goals are in the program. And, you know, one example that we have in mind, not that, this is our, our uh, fundamental business model for this research, but certainly uh, drones and uh, putting intelligence, agility, adaptability into drones is an intriguing challenge that uh, the computing field uh, faces. So if you just look at this, this emerging field of drone racing that really has just only been around for the last few years, uh, you can see this photo here from a 2018 uh, racing. I think that might've been the first year they had a competition at IROS. You know, it's, it's incredible from some perspective what is now possible. This completely new category of device that had not been possible until the last few years, which is racing drones autonomously uh, in the manner that humans might uh, have, have guided drones just, you know, years before for the first time. Uh, but now completely under technology control, these drones are able to detect uh, gates and fly between them uh, at, at a pretty reasonable speed. And, and that's, you know, been enabled through progress in uh, technology. So process chip design technology. So the, the gains of, you know, a million X since the early uh, dawn of, of the von Neumann computing model um, and with, that Moore's law has given us uh, shrinking that intelligence, that capability, putting ever larger scales into tinier and tinier form factors to the point that now such things as drones, autonomous drones are possible. And of course, deep learning has been the other ingredient, what we've just been talking about in the intro here of the, this ability to recognize in this incredibly high dimensional cluttered space, uh, identifying you know, what the objective is here, where these gates are, and then uh, being able to guide the, the drone uh, to, you know, through them, through on a particular uh, defined course. So, so this is pretty impressive what is now possible. And of course, this field is, is advancing quickly and they're moving you know, from walking speed to jogging speed, perhaps flying between these portals. Um, but if we step back and we look at brains, we don't even have to think about human brains. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about human brains in the, in the intro here, but just consider the simplest or some of the simpler brains that we see uh, that we might uh, seek to uh, emulate in their capability. Um, look at the cockatiel parrot and compare what is possible in birds. You know, we kind of pejoratively will speak of bird brains, but in, in, in this case, if you look at side by side, what a cockatiel parrot is able to do compared to our best autonomous drones today, there's still a dramatic difference uh, in the capabilities and the, the basic raw metrics of the efficiency and the speed of the responses. So a bird brain, a cockatiel parrot, is operating at, you know, almost 500 times lower power level than the compute of CPUs and GPUs on that, uh, that uh, autonomous drone. It's a fraction of the weight. It's navigating at up to 35 kilometers per hour and more than the speed that it's operating in and the, the, it's, its response times to uh, obstacles and, and you know the unforeseen that that comes in its path um, is the, the the versatility and the adaptation of the bird. So the bird has not been pre-trained to recognize just this one object of gates. A bird through its course of its lifetime and through the course of just relatively few presentations of a new environment or or uh, you know new types of food or uh, its peers, potential mates, anything uh, along these lines, it will learn in very few instances and adapt its behavior and, uh, you know, accordingly. So a bird is able to forage for food, uh, even 
speak certain uh, human language words, learning those, of course, that's not something a, a bird was evolutionarily programmed to do. There's even reports uh, of, of being able to manipulate cups, uh, another object that did not exist in its evolutionary past, and, and really understand what a cup can be useful for in terms of drinking. Um, and so these, of course, go way beyond what, what our autonomous drones can do today. Um, the drones are, you know, with, with a great amount of pre-labeled data, pre-collected, uh, it, it, they can be trained to recognize and perform this one very particular task, but it is far from, from encompassing the wide range of capabilities that, that uh, you find uh, birds implementing today. So even if we just take that, that one example, we have a, a long way uh, to go and, 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 and we believe a lot to learn from, uh, from nature and even the simplest brains and even insects maybe. So now, you know, this uh, perspective here is what we, we touched on in the intro and, and this is, uh, what is what is quickly uh, racing to the forefront of everyone's mind in, in mainstream computing and that deep learning as uh, powerful as it is, is incredibly power hungry. And, and what's more than just the raw power and the, the size of these models is stressing our, our compute capabilities conventionally today uh, is the pace of increase that we see here. So over a span of, uh, of six years or so, the model Model sizes and the amount of compute required to train these models uh, grew by a factor of 300,000. And that's even a somewhat old number. That's that's even faster pace in the last few years we've seen. Uh, so that's that's a, a tremendous incre increase in compute demands compared to say the 8x that would be provided by Moore's law over that same period of time. And we all know that Moore's law is uh, facing its own headwinds today. And uh, you know we can't even necessarily rely on uh, on the same gains coming so for free, so to speak, from a, a, a programmer's perspective, just by nature of of shrinking feature sizes in silicon. So so, bottom line, as as powerful as this tool is, uh, it, it's not on a trajectory that's going to close that gap with the cockatiel brain compared to the uh, compared to the autonomous drone. But, um, you know, as we were also talking about in the intro session there, um, it, it's not just the efficiency and the sheer computational uh, heft of deep learning that, that poses some challenges that we'd like to address through neural inspiration, but it's, it's the fundamental limitations in other respects. Uh, so th this learning capability, you needn't look very far or much further than just that, that one example of how, how rapidly, how efficiently natural brains learn from, you know, in a continuous, uh, continual way. So absorbing new information and with relatively few examples can generalize and form new uh, ideas and associations with past knowledge, uh, building up understanding of the world and uh, the objectives for that organism in a hierarchical manner. Um, and, uh, you know, compared to deep learning where the data generally has to be all pre-connected -connect and be available beforehand before you deploy these devices. Uh, it, the training is happening offline in a very batched manner. So in the data center before you can actually deploy these models. Uh, and it, th there's, there's no uh, automatic generalization from individual ex examples having you know, a disproportionate effect on the behavior of that model. Uh, the, the data has to be distributed in a uniform way. Uh, otherwise you're going to catastrophically disrupt the pre-learned information in that neural network. Uh, so it, it, an example here is just a, a think of a, of a child or a baby, an infant, uh, learning what a cat is for the first time. That, that toddler can learn a couple different views of a different, uh, of, of different cats, a couple examples of that, and, and then they've got it. They understand what a cat is, and at that point, it can even understand a cartoon of a cat, which clearly does not uh, draw from its pre-trained data set uh, in the case of this child, um, and nevertheless, uh, the babies will be able to, toddlers anyway, can, can recognize cartoons. So there's clearly something beyond curve fitting, beyond just understanding the, the statistical scope of the data that had been provided. So it's these sorts of things that are urging us to uh, 
look to the brain uh, once again for inspiration. After all, deep learning neural networks today as they're deployed uh, came from peering inward to the brain. And uh, it's, it's a challenge though, because we don't have either the right hardware architecture to support the kind of models, the types of algorithms we'd like to explore at scale. Uh, and, and at the same time, we don't have that algorithmic understanding, which is, which is what we had been also discussing in the intro there. And so what we're trying trying to do in our, our research in Intel Labs is co-design these two. So put ourselves into a completely different regime of computing by providing prototype architectures, prototype silicon that is informed by the best understandings from the algorithmic studies uh, that, that then hopefully provide some, uh, some measurable progress. And, and, and by shifting people's mindset and by growing a community that's thinking in this more neural inspired paradigm, we can then in turn uh, motivate progress on the algorithmic side, which, which becomes a virtuous cycle and we hope to ultimately lead to uh, commercializable technology. And so already just through this process, uh, you know, we've, we've arrived on a silicon architecture, of course, building on the shoulders of others who's come before us in this field uh, to, to adapt adopt a very different perspective on what neural networks even are. So if you look at, uh, you know, the, the conventional deep learning uh, model that's so in widespread deployment today on the, on the left here, you know, you have this very linear feed forward structure. Um, even recurrent models are trained in a feed forward manner and they're treated as uh, it, functions that are provided inputs and produce outputs uh, without any state necessarily stored and uh, relevant within each neuron. And uh, neuromorphic networks, the type that we've implemented in our chips and the types we're studying uh, have fundamentally have temporal state in each neuron. And that state has some course of evolution um, and, and potentially time varying once you add in plasticity mechanisms into these networks. And that, that is the most key defining property of what we call neuromorphic networks compared to conventional uh, deep networks. And, and unfortunately, from an algorithmic perspective, it means that much of what uh, is being applied today in the deep learning world, uh, it, it breaks down. These models are not differentiable. They uh, applying stochastic gradient descent becomes extremely difficult to optimize the parameters of such networks. And so some of the basic mathematical tools one might apply are, are no longer available. And we have to go back to this algorithmic study, the theory, and, and hopefully motivate, um, you know, functional algorithms. And that there is great progress happening in this field. I've listed here some of the uh, example algorithmic priorities uh, or directions that we see as being particularly uh, compelling and productive. Uh, and, and they're providing good results that I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing shortly on running on real silicon, which is what, what we've provided to the community. Another uh, different way of looking at this is compare the hardware architecture and you know what we've arrived at here, moving away from just what is commonly considered parallel computing or more precisely data parallel computing that's made uh, GPU so useful for, for deep learning. Uh, the, the, the fundamental uh, architecture is, is truly different. Uh, in this case, what we've implemented with neuromorphic models, meaning there isn't this, this, uh, this architectural divide between the computing elements and the memory elements. And that split, that top level split in the architecture has a fundamental rippling implication into the types of functions and the way you think about uh, computing and also what is efficient versus not efficient to implement on, on, on different architectures. In a neuromorphic architecture shown, shown below, there isn't that separate memory. The memory elements, as I say, uh, similar to the biological neural uh, neurons, the state is embedded in the neurons and embedded in the synaptic connections which are physically distributed in the, uh, the, the chip itself uh, and, and not being stored out sideband, which then has to be fetched and cycled through the uh, computing elements of this architecture. So when you're, when you're in that traditional architecture needing to fetch all your state from a separate memory, perhaps through multiple hierarchies of caches and other types of local memories, you're, you're, you have to use that memory interface efficiently. And that 
steers the entire uh, efficient functional evaluation into this vectorized form. You have to keep these channels of communication to the memory uh, occupied and uh, utilized so that you're not wasting the resources, the time, the energy that you've spent on this, this, uh, you know, this separated architecture, this partitioned architecture, which means you're forced into this vectorized approach. As you receive data from the external world shown in this, you know, on the right panel there, uh, you have to wait, you have to collect it and build up a vectorized form or a, a batch, which can then be streamed out and utilizing the memory efficiently. So what you have with conventional data parallel computing is vectorized matrix arithmetic formulated functions. And they can't change. Individual state elements cannot be adapted efficiently in response to new data samples that arrive individually in time. I mean, if only looking no further than just that basic architectural perspective, uh, there's an enormous challenge to try to implement the types of plasticity mechanisms and learning that one finds in the brain, sure, surely because this is the tool, uh, the computational tool that's available to an algorithmic researcher who's using this uh, today's conventional computing architecture. So again, neuromorphic computing is very different from that. You have the state elements embedded in the uh, network uh, in the chip itself, which means you're not into this vectorized matrix arithmetic uh, world. You're into a, a, a regime where individual data samples can arrive and, and have their effect and they can be processed by this, this distributed network in real time, producing outputs in real time, and even adapting the parameters of the network in real time, uh, which, which opens the door at least to the, to the basic idea we see from happening in real brains of self-organization happening just autonomously within the network, absorbing information, rewiring and reparametrizing that network so that the fitness and the, the objectives of the, of the function are better served. Now, of course, that's that's just the high level goal. There's a uh, huge challenges in actually realizing such self-organization that approaches the capabilities of what one can train in this vectorized back propagation gradient descent uh, mode of, of, of uh, machine learning. But nevertheless, that's, that's the goal is to provide an architecture that allows this kind of algorithmic research to happen. So at Intel, um, as, as probably you all know, we've, um, we've published uh, our Loihi chip. This is now, you know, three years ago. It was three years ago, uh, NICE, where we uh, unveiled the chip and for the first uh, sort of public talk, we had already published it, but, but this was uh, in, in many ways the public unveiling. We hosted our first workshop uh, actually at Intel in Oregon, Hillsboro. Uh, and uh, so great memories of, of the NICE that year and, and sharing it for the first time with this, uh, you know, very eager community. Um, and uh, I, I, I won't, you know, go through all of these properties because I think they're they're you know quite well understood by this this community by now, and and they're you know move they're they're leveraging much of what I've just spoken about in terms of the principles we're we're looking to. Um, I think one thing I'll, I'll call out is that. You know, we don't have floating point numbers. We don't have multiply accumulators. We don't have the off-chip DRAM elements. These fundamental elements that are uh, seen as as essential in in uh, conventional processors, conventional GPUs, and deep learning accelerators today. So, what? capabilities we're able to demonstrate with Loihi are clearly being enabled in a completely different perspective, a different view of, uh, of how to compute um, compared to CPUs and GPUs. The, the legacy of seven decades of von Neumann architectural development, basically. What we've done with Loihi by now is um, is deploy these, and uh, unfortunately, we missed um, you know last year's Nice, which we we would have highlighted our, our latest Poiki Spring system, which is this uh, large five rack unit uh, chassis that you see on the right here. Um, so we we uh, uh, built that last year, and uh, we uh, deployed that and uh, commissioned it for use by the INRC. Um, We've even delivered uh, one of these to our, our close partner, Sandia National Labs, and they're um, fast working with this as well, scaling up models to, uh, to, to the large scale. Um, relatively little use of this, I have to say, uh, in this intervening year, and that's maybe somewhat of a disappointing uh, disappointment to us, uh, but it, it really does highlight the, the fact that we need to start with the basics and uh, really figure out how to um, extract capability, demonstrate an algorithmic understanding, which is scalable up to such a high level. But again, it's 
the, the economic value of neuromorphic in the near term comes from the edge side of things. Uh, this Poiki Spring system has 768 chips in it. Uh, it implements 100 million neurons. Um, and if we were to sell such a system, I'm not going to you know, speculate on a price, but it, it wouldn't be a cheap system. So it's going to really have to solve some seriously hard problems uh, to, to justify commercializing such technology. The, the edge is likely where we're going to see uh, the earliest uh, uh, commercialization. That said, there's some intriguing results as we scale our models up to the high, uh, high end um, in, in terms of what we've deployed. We, we've de um, demonstrated a nearest neighbor search uh, example on, on this uh, full scale system. And, uh, and, and many of the algorithms we're looking at, as I'll show you, uh, show intriguing gains in efficiency and speed compared to conventional solutions as you scale up these, these networks. So, so the, the, the high end has great promise in the neuromorphic world and in this kind of embedded compute and memory architecture. But uh, I think uh, the economic viability is not quite there yet. Of course, we've also built edge devices. You can see in the top right here, uh, we have our Kapoho Bay system, which connects directly to uh, event-based cameras. So the Davis 240C, uh, as well as other sensors, uh, allowing uh, robotics and other real world, you know, visual sensing and learning uh, algorithms to be prototyped. Okay, so we're uh, certainly not trying to, you know, boil the ocean and solve all the problems ourselves at, at Intel. Uh, you know, at, at the same time, three years ago at NICE, we launched the Intel Neuromorphic Research Community, uh, and that's grown rapidly over these years. Um, we've, we're now up to over 120 groups around the world, um, spanning many, many academic uh, groups, uh, as well as government labs, and an increasing number of corporate members, uh, which we're quite excited about because it, it means that the progress that the community is making is attracting uh, mainstream business interest, seeing that potentially there are problems that they have that are uh, you know, commercially relevant that uh, neuromorphic technology may be ready to solve and motivate putting the technology uh, you know, into the world in commercialized form. So let's, uh, with that, let's move on to discuss uh, um, some of the low heat results we've had. Uh, so there's a, there's a long list by now, um, and I'll just go through some of the highlights, um, you know, sort of broken down by the sort of major domain of study. Uh, so in the sensing domain, we're seeing uh, some, you know, very uh, intriguing, compelling results, um, especially when the data formats of, uh, are, are rethought out and, and taken all the way down to this fundamental spiking event-based uh, paradigm. So one of the challenges certainly that we see with Loihi is, is that IO can be a bottleneck with conventional data formats because conventional data are formulated in conventional ways in this vectorized manner uh, with very dense data formatting. And that's not compatible with the the event-based, sparse, spike-based uh, representations that we have in, inside Loihi. But as you connect up things like these uh, event cameras, uh, we can uh, natively send these events from the sensor into the chip. And we've been able to demonstrate things like uh, gesture recognition uh, at uh, very low power levels, uh, 15 milliwatts of dynamic power, both for the camera and Loihi combined. Uh, and, and furthermore, moving from that, the work of uh, M. Ray Nefji, Kenneth Stewart, his student, um, incorporating some minimal level, you know, some, some preliminary uh, online learning capabilities uh, using some of the um, kind of approximate backprop ideas uh, to, to learn new gestures with just a few presentations at, um, at power levels not much higher than, than these numbers here that I've stated. Um, also, by fusing data streams, we have examples where we can take these emerging event-based tactile sensors. So uh, Ben T and his group at National University of Singapore has, has demonstrated the fusion of tactile sensor, sensory input and visual event-based input and, and showing that they can categorize and classify objects more accurately than with either event stream uh, by itself. Um, and this is relevant for you know, all manner of robotic uh, deployments. Uh, um, this, this sense of touch is so desperately lacking. And this is allowing, for example, a cup that might have different levels of, uh, of, of liquid in it. If you can't see the liquid, vision is not very useful for understanding how much force should be applied to lift and, and hold on to an object. That sense of touch is, is essential. So the combination of touch and tactile um, will be incredibly useful for, uh, it, for robotic manipulators of, of real world objects in the future. And not only are we showing better classification accuracy by fusing 
using these event-based streams. Uh, the, the same processing algorithm, if you try to formulate that in, on a, and run it on a GPU, we're 45 times lower power on Loihi, 20% faster than, than the GPU. There's been some great results in uh, keyword spotting of, of audio signals, so the wake-on voice type of uh, um, the function. And then uh, most intriguing of all is uh, learning olfactory uh, signals, so odors uh, that have been collected in the wild, chemical signatures. And uh, this is an example of taking a direct neuroscience model, biophysical, low-level model, and abstracting these features to the point that they can then run on Loihi. And what we find is not only can uh, such a network uh, classify odors with, with better accuracy than uh, conventional, whole manner of uh, conventional algorithms, including a deep learning algorithm, the learning capability inspired again by biology, one-shot learning uh, is, is with a single presentation to Loihi, we can classify odors from this data set uh, as well as what it would take to train a deep learning model with 3000 times more sample per class. So this is, perhaps unique to the uh, chemical sensing modality. We, we haven't yet been able to you know, generalize this to other uh, domains, uh, but clearly there's something very important with associative learning happening here in a very compact, efficient network that's uh, again, directly inspired from, uh, from biology. That, that works in nature machine intelligence. You can go read about that. Um, then from the robotics and the uh, drone space, uh, we've seen a lot of activity. In fact, I would say this is probably the uh, plurality, at least, of, of our INRC members are interested in this domain. I think many see this as the long-term uh, uh, promising direction for neuromorphic, the killer domain, so to speak. Um, we've had uh, examples of adaptive robotic arms that are able to uh, sort of learn the deviations that uh, real-world effects like friction and unmodeled forces, uh, you know, how they disrupt the control of that arm, be able to rewire the control mechanism so that uh, it can reachieve that reaching behavior that's desired. Um, uh, Yulia Sandemirskaya and her collaborators at uh, IIT have shown some really nice results on, on the iCub robot platform of integrating some of these diverse different behaviors, which is often the challenge is to integrate different capabilities all into one platform and showing that uh, the iCub is able to scan through the world uh, identify objects and understand where they are in the field of view, and then being able to later recognize if, if an object is uh, one of those past learned objects or something new that then needs to be learned again in a associative fast few shot manner. I've got some SLAM examples. So this head direction localization and learning. So uh, uh, Konstantinos McMizos and uh, Yulia again uh, have demonstrated some examples of being able to use visual cues and, and learn that in a, a place field setting. So understanding where in the visual uh, uh, scene these, these visual landmarks are and using that then to orient and uh, uh, the, the head direction of these, uh, these robotic agents. Uh, examples of very high speed response. So control, closed loop control using uh, event-based vision input. This is uh, an example we unveiled uh, just a few months ago of uh, again, Yulia's work actually. So taking, uh, uh, building on prior work that David Scaramuzza had done at uh, ETH Zurich using conventional compute, using event-based camera input and tracking at very low latency, the movement of this, of a spinning disc that's moving unpredictably with a horizon on it and showing the lowest latency response response to that visual input to control a, a one-dimensional uh, robotic uh, harness to track that horizon. So that's been demonstrated at two milliseconds of, of closed loop latency, including the IO, and running at an event rate of 22 times faster than what the CPU on the same platform was able to support. Uh, pretty recently, there's also been a, a, a drone that's been had Loihi on it and has been able to land safely multiple times using just 35 neurons that have been evolutionarily trained. So this is uh, uh, De Kroon's lab at TU Delft. And, uh, and this is, of course, going in this kind of very much of bio-inspiration all the way to the point of training networks in the way that uh, biological neural networks, biological brains have been evolved uh, and, uh, and, and seeking the, the absolute uh, most efficient, most uh, uh, a compact uh, form of control that you might obtain and uh, maybe say in, you might find in an insect brain or something like that. Um, so this could be uh, critical for enabling extremely small scale uh, mobile devices 
and, uh, and dealing with some of the resource constraints that we have on neuromorphic chips. And then finally, the, the biggest, uh, most compelling results, uh, arguably, that, that we find uh, with Loihi are actually on more abstract computational problems. Uh, and, you know, these have a lot of connection to the types of cognitive functions that are happening in the brain, though uh, certainly we have a step or two to go until we're really connecting it to, to real world data and, and, and learning and deploying some of these kind of planning, search and, um, you know, uh, optimization capabilities that we've demonstrated. Um, but nevertheless, the, we have, uh, for example, graph search. So the most classic computer science algorithm, um, you know, Dijkstra, basically a wavefront search through the neuromorphic mesh is able to leverage the parallelism of the architecture and find shortest paths in, in arbitrary graphs up to 100 times faster than what a Xeon CPU can perform on those same graphs. And that's using time, temporal propagating wavefronts and, and, and even plasticity to record what the shortest paths are in, in that network. So this is a fundamental different way than what most would think you might use a neural network for. Um, we have um, that nearest neighbor search problem I mentioned, uh, scaled up and implemented on our Poiki spring system and showing you know, faster and lower energy search than what an equivalent a state of the art or uh, an equivalent implementation would take on a CPU. And if you achieve the same levels of speed and energy or speed anyway on a conventional implementation, uh, we're then orders of magnitude faster in being able to, to program new search patterns into the database. Uh, there's a there's a paper on that you can learn more about it. Uh, recently, Sandia has shown some uh, some success in scaling up their heat diffusion modeling. So uh, you know very much a physics oriented modeling problem, but using stochastic diffusion random walkers in a, a large scale neuromorphic system, it's able to model the diffusion of heat um, and a, a particular PDE in this system, and uh, that that that's showing a lot of promise. So some of these uh, uh, you can learn more about in our tutorial that's happening tomorrow. So in particular, we're gonna go into the combinatorial optimization problem, which I, I think is our re most recent result. Uh, and we're very excited about this. Uh, this is a classically hard problem. So provably NP complete problem of, uh, you know, constraint satisfaction, SAT solvers, and we're able to run and solve real world problems on, on Loihi uh, that with uh, up to 40 times faster than a CPU, 2000 times lower energy. And, and recently we've now started working with a commercial entity, Deutsche Bahn, on, on their train scheduling workloads and showing that we can in fact take real world, uh, those still now on the smaller side of what they might uh, deploy commercially, but real world train scheduling problems and solve these 14 times faster than what their commercial solver that they pay money to go and, and, and uh, use for scheduling uh, their rail network. Um, so uh, using just a single low heat chip. So this kind of gain is just not what you expect to find in conventional uh, computing. We're clearly getting, some, we're onto something very intriguing and powerful here. Uh, and and uh, and it's still early days in, in that. So, what's very exciting to me is now having a whole suite of computational quantified results that we can take all these data points and and chart them out on a two dimensional axis. Um, the energy gain that we get by running these workloads on Loihi and the solution time gain. And uh, you know this is expressed in terms of the conventional architecture's energy divided by Loihi's energy, the solution time on a conventional architecture divided by Loihi's solution time. So top right in this chart is better for Loihi. It's providing some gain in either the speed of processing or uh, and or the energy, typically both. Uh, and so you can see there's a lot of points that fall to the top right of this kind of the product parity line, which is uh, the conventional line where below which you would say the architecture is indisputably worse for this task than it uh, otherwise uh, might be. So we're finding against a variety of different uh, conventional uh, architectures, low heat gives gains. What's really inter uh, interesting is how the data partitions out so cleanly. So feed forward deep ne networks are, are all providing the least compelling gains here. And in many cases, when you go to large conventionally formulated deep networks, the things like mobile nets and resnets and others that you would be running conventionally on, on uh, GPUs, Loihi is not providing any gains at all. And there's you know, good reason for that. 
um, the, the gains are really coming from recurrent neural networks. You know, all the neural networks that I'm aware of in the brain are recurrent. You find recurrence and feedback processes fundamentally in the brain. And that we, we can understand by looking at these examples, how the efficiency and how the speed uh, is, uh, emerges uh, from recurrent neural networks as opposed to uh, the feed forward type. Um, and, and furthermore, there's this intriguing scalability property that I mentioned, where in many cases, as we go to larger problem scales, we find that the gain that Loihi provides gets better compared to smaller networks. So this bodes really well over the long term of scaling up the architecture uh, to, to uh, you know, very large sizes and getting incredible gains, many orders of magnitude. So now on the deep learning front, um, you know, if we zoom into those points that are, you know, not some, some of which aren't so compelling, um, we can break this down a little further. And we find that the least compelling of the deep learning category are, are traditional ANNs that have just been converted with rate coding, spikes that are rate coded to emulate the, the activity, the graded continuous activation value of an ANN. Um, these really, we don't see much promise in these, frankly, at all. Um, the, they, they can be low energy because of the sparsity and, and the increasing sparsity as you get through the depth of the, the layers of such networks, but the latency is terrible. So these are very slow compared to what you can compute conventionally. Uh, they don't scale well either. So as you go beyond a couple layers, the the inaccuracies, the, the uh, errors that uh, get introduced inevitably from this low precision regime of, of uh, rate coding um, compound and, uh, and, and which means that even the scalability of this class is, is quite questionable. So, so bottom line, converting ANNs into a, a rate coded spike implementation is not uh, a, very, a very compelling uh, uh, approach. What is a lot more compelling is to apply the back propagation technique to optimize the individual spike times in, in in a, in a spiking network. And here we find that you can achieve low latency and low, uh, low energy. And the, the most compelling points within this class of, of, of algorithms are all coming uh, from that uh, paradigm. Uh, the downside is that they're very hard to train. So spiking neural networks, as everyone knows, you know, they're not differentiable. They're very difficult to uh, train in the deep learning paradigm. Um, so it, while it's possible to do it, uh, it, it, it the, the inaccuracies of the modeling compound as you go to large scale again, for, you know, so for different reasons than for the converted class, as you scale up to large networks, this technique runs into serious challenges. Uh, so that just is to say that we can't take this black box approach to spiking neural networks. Um, you know, maybe we can in, in include, you know, clever features into the uh, networks that perhaps make them a little better for, for differentiable tuning. But, um, but ultimately, uh, these spiking neural networks, event-based neural networks of any kind, are, are just inherently less trainable with gradient descent as uh, ANNs. That will be a fundamental challenge. Now, there's a, one example so far of, of implementing, at least that is fully quantified, of this kind of online backpropagation, of applying the backpropagation idea in uh, an approximated form into the chip. And that's uh, the, the adaptive robotic arm example I showed earlier. So that, uh, that is actually giving quite good results. It's actually a recurrent network. Once you pull in this, this error back propagation uh, information into the network, it's, it's now recurrent. And, and accordingly, we do see some, uh, it, it giving a, a pretty good quantified result compared to a conventional implementation of an ANN type of network doing the same thing. And you can learn more about the, this uh, backprop based uh, examples using the Slayer tool that we're gonna cover that in our tutorial tomorrow as well. So ultimately what we're seeing with Loihi is, uh, is that order of magnitude gains are possible. So these are not the percentage gains that we've become accustomed to in you know, conventional computing. Um, you know, these are thousand X gains in en energy efficiency, uh, up to hundred X gain in speed, both of these combined in the same implementation. So hundred thousand gains in energy delay uh, product. Um, you know, metrics like these are really, really hard to achieve. Um, with anything short of, a, of an absolute hardening of a particular algorithm into an ASIC or a specialized chip. Loihi is a programmable chip, so it's really notable that we're able to get these kind of gains with a, a, a programmable architecture. It's not programmable in the conventional sense, but we can span a huge range of different types of workloads and algorithms, all implemented in one chip, um, uh, you know, outperforming conventional uh, architectures by a large margin. 
Um, now, th there is the significant challenge we face at a very fundamental level, and that's the higher cost per function that we have in, uh, in the neuromorphic architecture. And this is, you know, you most see this as you scale up to larger networks. So as you get beyond the sort of the fixed cost associated with, with packaging and, uh, you know, a memory architecture, you have uh, the scalability that runs at the cost per bit of the SRAM memory elements that we use in a neuromorphic neuromorphic chip. To scale up to a larger workload, we need more neuromorphic chips. Uh, conventionally, to scale up to larger workloads, you just use more DRAM, which is almost 100x cheaper than, uh, than an SRAM uh, state bit. So this is a fundamental headwind facing the commercialization of this technology. And for the foreseeable future is going to limit deployments of neuromorphic technology to the edge, to small scale edge embedded devices, uh, I, I believe. So if we zoom in into this recurrent category, um, we can break this down into, you know, we, we can see that basically the, uh, the efficiency and the capabilities that come from this class of highly successful networks on neuromorphic architectures um, arises from computing with collective dynamics. This is getting beyond that vectorized feed forward function that GPUs are so good at evaluating and now involves dynamic, uh, feedback loops on all scales and the network is self-organizing either through its you know static dynamics with with fixed parameters or as you add in plasticity mechanisms you allow uh, the network to evolve and and uh, it itself the training process is a dynamic process so back propagation stochastic gradient descent is a collective dynamics uh, operation so that's a dynamical system when you conventionally train a large deep neural network uh, you know the individual steps in involved in training a network are not as important as optimizing the loss function, the dynamics that you've you know, orchestrated the, the training process to achieve. Um, and, and that type of behavior of optimizing an objective through the dynamics of the system is what all of this category of recurrent neural networks running on Loihi giving great results. They're all uh, uh, basically examples of that paradigm of computing. Now, not all of these uh, categories uh, are, are, are leading to the same degree of progress. We, we do face significant progress in the gradient descent to deep neural networks. Um, and so this is, you know, leads us to kind of final perspectives here on, on the learning in, in neuromorphic architectures. You know, we've invested a lot of, of effort to uh, support learning rules in Loihi. And reflecting now on what's been done in the category of learning networks, um, we see that gradient-based learning, and that's, that's the gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, approximated backpropagation types of, of models mapped into a neuromorphic form, um, they, while the promise is clear, we should be able to scale to deep networks and then learn, you know, at scale this way. Um, the reality is a lot more challenging because uh, there's been no example shown to date of scaling beyond one or perhaps two layers in Loihi. Um, and, and fundamentally, uh, you know, not only is the, the hardware difficult and the algorithms difficult to get right in this case, but th they will still have the same data efficiency of backpropagation itself, which means they're extremely data hungry, they're slow to learn. The data samples will need to be uniformly distributed over time, otherwise the parameters get catastrophically disrupted. So uh, certainly these perhaps can be overcome through smarter formulations of the network and uh, scoping and modulating the plasticity processes in, in, in such networks. But bottom line is we still, it's not as, as, as easy as just approximating back propagation and then we're done. Uh, the, certainly that can be good for fine tuning, kind of slow adaptive types of capabilities. So that one example I mentioned, which is the robotic arm adaptation example, that's basically the Delta rule or a one layer form of uh, a back prop. Uh, that works really well, but scaling beyond that, we, we really uh, face some fundamental algorithm challenges, not to mention the hardware uh, uh, challenge of not having sparse updates anymore. And then there's the non-gradient domain, which is really intriguing. This is, for example, that olfactory learning network that I mentioned, where there's a projection to a high dimensional space and there's associative learning happening in this projected high dimensional space. And that, that clearly uh, can be very fast and efficient with data, but there's not much theory in that domain. Um, so I think that there's a big promise in, in that direction, more work to be done. And in particular, by fusing these two different approaches, we should be able to get uh, 
you know, using each where they belong, uh, we, we, we should be able to get some really exciting uh, gains in the future. So speaking of the future, uh, closing here with our outlook to commercialization, you know, now as much as ever, we see a huge uh, uh, range of possible applications. And if anything, you know, I think in the field, we're very fragmented and different researchers are all going and exploring in different directions. And, you know, what, what we really want to see first, more than anything else, is convergence in this kind of inner circle of tools and methods and uh, software platforms that, that uh, and, and, and architectures and features even on the silicon side that can align the community uh, to, to focus on the nearest term paths to commercial viability. And so uh, here I've shown, you know, many of the uh, uh, domains that where we see promise, um, kind of the, the distance in the bar, the radial bars here are kind of showing what might be, uh, you know, nearer versus, versus further out uh, commercial viability. Um, certainly processing audio is a, a great example where we think we'll see this earlier rather than later. Um, we'll probably see commercialization of neuromorphic technology in a very quiet way initially, where it becomes IP blocks. It's hardware that's incorporated into a larger, say, Intel SoC uh, that you might not even be aware that it's, it's there necessarily from a user perspective. It's not going to fundamentally change what the device is capable of doing. It's just going to provide more efficient uh, implementations of the necessary functions. And then over time, we'll be able to scale up, we'll solve the scalability problems, put the technology out into the real world eventually scaled up to you know very large scale uh, but uh, you know that that is coming so that's uh, I think the future is very bright for for neuromorphic computing and uh, yeah thanks for your attention and uh, attend our, our tutorial tomorrow you can hear a lot more on the details and uh, and uh, happy to answer any questions now <laughs>